Warning, graphic or violent content. This program contains material that may be disturbing to some audience members. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. Today, when a wealthy media mogul and his wife threaten to change their last will and testament, it becomes a death sentence. The two are murdered inside their million dollar mansion and police are quickly convinced it's an inside job. You're watching Crime Files, The Homefront. Around midnight on August 20th, 1989, a call is made to 911. What happened? I'm sorry to tell my parents. Jose and Kitty Menendez are slaughtered in the family room of their Beverly Hills home. They've been shot multiple times with a 12-gauge shotgun. Police think the murder has the markings of a mob hit. This isn't a crime of passion. This is cold-blooded, remorseless killing. Long before he was murdered in his own home, Cuban-born Jose Menendez seemed destined for the American dream. At 16, Jose immigrated to the United States, escaping Cuba in 1960 after the Castro regime took over there. Jose is a talented swimmer and wins a four-year athletic scholarship to Southern Illinois University. When Jose is a senior, he falls in love with a freshman, Mary Kitty Anderson. Kitty is a beauty pageant winner. She grew up in a kind of a middle-class family in Oaklawn, Illinois. Despite coming from different backgrounds, the two fall hard for one another. Both families have a problem with this relationship, though the two apparently are immediately in love. Neither family wants these kids to get married this young. Regardless of their family's reservations, when Kitty graduates from college, the couple decide to elope. The newlyweds then move to New York. Kitty gets a job as a school teacher and Jose continues his study at Queens College. Jose Menendez gets out with a CPA and immediately goes into a career path that is meteoric. No other way to describe it. Within three years, he's the president of a container firm. In January 1968, the couple welcome their first son, Lyle. Two years later, they celebrate the birth of a second son, Eric. Kitty quits her job to focus on family. Jose continues his meteoric rise. At the age of 35, he becomes global manager for Hertz Corporation, which is a huge position for a kid roughly, you know, 10 years out of college. But while his career skyrockets, his marriage spirals downhill. His infidelities are slowly discovered by Kitty, apparently had been going on for a long time, multiple mistresses. He even got to the point of buying one of his mistresses a townhouse in Manhattan. She wants to get out of this marriage, but she doesn't want to divorce her husband. She literally spirals into Great Depression and wants to kill herself. For the sake of her sons, Kitty carries on, choosing to stand by her husband as he continues his corporate climb. Eventually, he becomes an executive at RCA and then is moved over to a division called Live Entertainment, which is in California. And at this time, he has to uproot his family and move Kitty to California, which causes her to leave all of her friends and family on the East Coast, which is something she wasn't excited to do, but she follows her husband there dutifully. According to sources, Jose's co-workers view him as a ruthless leader. Jose develops kind of a reputation for being very strict and stern with his employees, and it's something the corporate culture doesn't take kindly to because the, some of the subordinates underneath him don't like the way he treats them. Jose's reputation at home isn't so different. His sons seek his approval, but can they meet his expectations? Coming up, the American dream becomes a nightmare for Jose Menendez and youngest son Eric has a chilling vision about how it could all end. You're watching Crime Files, The Homefront. Warning, graphic or violent content. This program contains material that may be disturbing to some audience members. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. In 1986, deep in the throes of a loveless marriage, Wealthy entertainment executive Jose Menendez and his wife Kitty start anew in Calabasas, California, on the outskirts of Los Angeles. But instead of focusing on each other, their teenage sons Lyle and Eric become the center of attention. Because Jose and Kitty Menendez had worked so hard all of their life, by the time Eric and Lyle are old enough to realize it, they're living a very privileged life. They have every want and need taken care of by their parents' wealth. 
Jose expects his sons to follow in his footsteps, and there's pressure to perform, especially on Lyle. Jose expects a lot of Lyle. Lyle, unfortunately, doesn't expect as much of himself, and he becomes kind of shiftless and lazy as he becomes a teenager. Average grades, doesn't excel exceptionally in school, and his father really wants him to go to an Ivy League school. While Lyle struggles to meet his family's expectations, younger brother Eric is lost in the shadows. He grows up knowing he's not the heir apparent, as Jose had considered Lyle. And uh, that causes him to be a little bit alienated. He and his brother Lyle both are considered somewhat sullen in school. They don't have a lot of friends, and they're somewhat loners. Lyle's first application to Princeton is rejected. But at his father's urging, he tries again the next year and gets in. Once he's at Princeton, he doesn't recognize that this, this Ivy League institution has very, very strict rules. And that code of honor means no cheating, no lying, no stealing, none of those things. Lyle gets caught basically uh, appropriating someone else's homework on a lab assignment and submitting it as his own. And that causes some problems. He's immediately facing disciplinary charges at Princeton, and it leads to a one-year suspension. Back in Calabasas, Jose has become executive vice president of the media company Live Entertainment. While Lyle returns home, Jose puts the 19-year-old to work at the office. His reputation there is even worse than his father Jose's. He's totally a disruption to other employees. He doesn't even like to show up for work. He would prefer to play tennis rather than coming to work in the morning. Eventually, Jose is made aware of this problem by some of the other employees who say, if this was anybody but your son, he would no longer work here. And at that point, Lyle is fired. Left with nothing but time to kill, Lyle commissions his 17-year-old brother, Eric, as his partner in crime. One of the hobbies they take on is burglaries, and they start breaking into homes. Apparently, they break into several homes, mostly the parents of their own friends. They literally are stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of cash, jewelry, and other belongings. They're eventually caught when Eric is pulled over in a traffic stop, and the belongings of some of these burglary victims are found in his car. Jose knows Lyle's chances of returning to Princeton will be over if the 20-year-old is convicted. So with the help of a lawyer, Lyle is absolved of any participation in the crime. In exchange, his younger brother, Eric, still a juvenile, accepts full responsibility. But both boys are forced to undergo psychological counseling. Dr. Jerome Ozeal is their therapist. With the burglaries being the talk of the town in Calabasas, the Menendez family packs up and moves to Beverly Hills. There, Jose buys a $4 million mansion with marble floors, tennis courts, a swimming pool, and a guest house. The home's previous occupants include Elton John and Prince. Lyle returns to Princeton, while Eric attends Beverly Hills High. One of the people that Eric bonds most with is a boy named Craig Signorelli. With him, Eric writes a screenplay. It's the story of a young heir to a family fortune who kills his parents for that fortune. It begs the question, does life imitate art or does art imitate life? Coming up, Jose and Kitty Menendez make a desperate move to straighten out their sons. That's what my dad told me, that I was out of the well. But it comes at the ultimate price. You're watching Crime Files, The Homefront. Warning, graphic or violent content. This program contains material that may be disturbing to some audience members. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. Lyle and Eric Menendez are plagued by poor grades and acts of juvenile delinquency. Their parents fear that both sons are out of control. In an attempt to force 21-year-old Lyle and 18-year-old Eric to grow up and take responsibility for their lives, Jose and Kitty make a bold move. So they dangle the carrot in front of them. If you don't straighten yourselves out, we're cutting you out of our will. On the evening of August 20th, 1989, the Menendez brothers plot a scheme to make sure they're not cut out of the will. Kitty and Jose are watching television in their family room when Lyle and Eric sneak up behind them. They shoot Jose in the back of the head, which would be a fatal blow from a 12-gauge shotgun. Kitty gets up screaming, so they fire the first round into her leg, wounding her, and then they finish her off. They shoot both of them in the knees to make it look like a mob hit, like they're being kneecapped. The path of destruction is incredible. A total of 16 rounds, 
they mutilate their bodies with these 12 gauge shotguns, each of them firing in rapid succession, so rapid that the neighbors thinks it's just fireworks going off. After murdering their father, Jose, and mother, Kitty, the brothers act quickly to establish an alibi. They buy movie tickets to make it seem like they were at a movie theater at the same time their parents were killed. And then they go out and they, again, they dump the shotguns into a canyon off Mulholland Drive. They take the shell casings and their bloody clothing and they dump them in a dumpster somewhere in a remote location. And then they return back to the house, they find the crime scene and they stage a 911 call. That's how I tell my parents. What happened? Who shot who? I don't hear anything. I just came home. You came home and found who shot? My mom and dad. The two detectives assigned to the case immediately have to look at the young brothers as possible suspects, but they're not their only suspects. Primarily because of Jose's reputation in, in the business world, there were a lot of people that uh, he had turned into enemies that should have been friends. And so the detectives have their work cut out for him, trying to figure out who might have done this, who had a motive to do this. I've been, not been told any statements that said that it was or was not a hit, or it was a robbery, or it was uh, something else. We're not sure, and we're not speculating at this time. But in the months that follow, a lavish spending spree elevates Lyle and Eric to the top of the list. Between the time of the parents' death in August of 1989 and the new year in January, the brothers spend somewhere around a million dollars of their parents' money. Lyle buys an expensive Rolex watch, a Porsche, and a restaurant in New Jersey. Eric hires a full-time tennis coach and competes in a series of pro tournaments in Israel. They do not sound like these are two bereaving young sons. It sounds more like they're enjoying the fact that they have now taken over the family's wealth, which was their objective, and they are spending it, wantonly spending it. And so this is a big clue for the detectives. Unfortunately, it's not evidence, but it's a clue. It isn't long before police obtain concrete evidence linking the Menendez brothers to their parents' death. One of the things that really builds the fact that these are true suspects is the fact that they hire a computer expert to come in the very day after their parents are killed to wipe clean Kitty Menendez's computer. Then he asked, was there a way I could erase the information to guarantee that it could never be recovered? Apparently, they had been made aware of the fact or found out that there was another last will and testament on the computer, and they wanted that computer file erased so that no one would find it. Police bring Eric in for questioning. When the detective interviews Eric, he uses a brilliant manipulation technique. What he does is he creates a fissure between the two brothers. And he says, I understand there's problems between you and Lyle. He's trying to build rapport with Eric, at the same time distance Eric from Lyle. And they get Eric to start talking about the fact that he was always in his brother's shadow and Lyle was always so overbearing and, and you know, just terrible to him, much like his father Jose was. After his interrogation, Eric panics reaching out to his therapist, Dr. Jerome Ozeal. And when he meets with him, he literally blurts out, we did it, we killed our parents. His justification is, my parents were gonna cut us out of their will. We had to do it. Basically, we had no choice. To Dr. Ozeal, this doesn't sound like it's a justifiable homicide, like it was self-defense or anything like that. This is brutal, cold-blooded murder. And so Dr. Ozeal starts to record his conversations with Eric. He also asks Eric to call his brother Lyle to join them. While Lyle is en route, Eric continues talking to the doctor, and he gives more and more detail about the crime and about what they did, so that by the time Lyle gets there, they're buried. They are totally buried in this, but there's something called the doctor-patient privilege, that anything that's discussed in that relationship stays in that relationship. It cannot be used in a court of law to prosecute someone. When Lyle arrives, He's shocked to learn his younger brother has confessed to murdering their parents. He's furious. Why the hell would you tell him? Why would you tell anybody? And now Lyle is in with Dr. Ozeal, and then Lyle makes a threat to Dr. Ozeal, which is truly the brother's undoing. With danger lurking, Dr. Ozeal asks his former patient and girlfriend, Judalon Smith, to eavesdrop on his meetings with the brothers. It's what she overhears that breaks the case wide open. And the conversation she heard between Eric and Lyle basically has Lyle saying to Eric, I can't believe you told him, now we have to kill him too. And then Eric 
a little bit of a conscience maybe. I don't know, maybe he's just tired of killing, but he tells Lyle, no, I can't do this. I'm not gonna do any more killing. You'll have to do it. Smith immediately reports her findings to police. And it's a big break in the case for that reason and for the fact that now they have a witness. She also reveals that the doctor's sessions were recorded. On March 8, 1990, detectives obtain a search warrant, hoping to find any documentation that will link the boys to their parents' death. So that's now the prime target of this investigation, getting that information, getting that evidence. And they get pages of notes and audio tapes from Dr. Ozeal. Three days later, Lyle Menendez is arrested near his home. Eric later turns himself into police. Both plead not guilty to two counts of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Faced with charges that warrant the death penalty, they're both held without bail. The charges are special circumstances for which you could be sentenced to death. Coming up, the Menendez brothers stun the courtroom with a shocking claim. They had no choice but to kill or be killed. You're watching Crime Files, The Home Front. Warning, graphic or violent content. This program contains material that may be disturbing to some audience members. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. Charged with the brutal murders of their parents, 22-year-old Lyle Menendez and his 19-year-old brother Eric spend three years in lockup awaiting their trials. They were placed in a uh, detention facility with some other high-profile people. O.J. Simpson was there and Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. In December 1992, a judge orders the brothers to be tried together, but with separate juries. From the onset, a media circus ensues. Yeah, I really can't upon, uh... This was a huge trial that is televised. On August 20th, 1989, Lyle and Eric Menendez killed their parents. And so all this information is coming out every day, and the reactions of the two brothers in the courtroom every day are being seen by the world that night on the Daily News. People are looking at cold-blooded killers that could be your sons. The prosecution theorizes that the brothers had lain in wait and perpetrated the murder of their parents. This was almost the perfect murder. One of the things anyone will recall who watched this trial was the testimony of Lyle on the stand. Why did you kill your parents? Because we were afraid. Lyle recounts how he had been physically abused since the age of six by his father, Jose, and that's why he had to kill his father. And this testimony is interrupted many, many times by his own crying and his brother's crying. He raped me. <laughs> and that it hurt me. Of course, they never notified authorities. They never notified their, their therapist that they were abused. None of this had ever come up prior to needing this information for a defense in a criminal trial for homicide. In turn, prosecutors call 26 witnesses, including the boys Beverly Hills therapist, Dr. Jerome Ozeal. Did either defendant ever tell you that they killed their parents due to sexual abuse? No, they did not. Dr. Ozeal testifies that Lyle and Eric told him they killed their father because he was dominating their lives and made them feel inferior. Lyle literally says that he thinks his father, Jose Menendez, would have been very proud of the boys for having committed such a perfect murder. And so here's this son that had always sought his father's admiration, yet never tried hard to get it, now seeks it in his father's own brutal murder. According to Dr. Ozeal, the boys claimed they killed their mother only because they couldn't leave a witness. They say that you know, they really didn't want to kill Kitty, but they kind of had to because they were worried what might happen if they killed just the father and Kitty knew about it. So she was kind of a loose end they had to take care of. The boys' own audio taped comments become the most damning evidence against them. One of the things it does is it brings out the truth they never mention any abuse other than they say that their father is controlling and they had to do it. It's very hard to take nine days of crying testimony and believe it when the next thing you hear is the same suspect expressly stating that he was proud of and bragging on the fact that he had killed his mother so that it would be a perfect way to cover up the crime of killing their father. 
And so it shows the absolute sociopathic nature of these brothers and the fact that there's no empathy in them. Prosecutors think they have an open and shut case of premeditated murder, but are stunned when both juries come back deadlocked. We regret to inform the court that we are unable to come to a unanimous decision on any of these three counts. The Los Angeles District Attorney's Office refuses to give up and decides to try the brothers a second time, taking a new approach. One thing that we have asked the judge to do is to limit the so-called abuse excuse, to limit evidence that has nothing to do with this case. So what they did this time was try the two brothers together, and they were also not allowing cameras in the courtroom. So this was not going to become a media circus like the first one was. This was strictly a trial. The prosecution theorizes that greed motivated the brothers to kill their parents. On August 26, 1996, the jury agrees. Lyle and Eric Menendez are found guilty of two counts of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. It's uh, very gratifying to see to what the justice was done in this case. In this case, they chose the life sentence without parole, and that may be an indication of why the first trial ended up in mistrial. Even with such a heinous crime, the possibility of life in prison instead of death possibly may have been what led to the conviction. It was kind of a, could they really do this thing? You know, could kids literally kill their parents like this? And that's a question that many, many people to this day probably still ask themselves.